Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last talked about A.P. Hill, he had just received word from Jefferson Davis that he would be transferred out of Florida and be assigned to the Coast Survey Office. While at the Coast Survey Office, he assisted a team studying the triangulation of the Hudson River between Albany and New Baltimore. Then he served as general assistant in the office and would run the office when his superior was absent. His superior wrote that Lieutenant A.P. Hill continues to occupy this position and the interest as well as ability displayed by him in performing the requirements of the office cannot fail to meet your warmest commendation. Besides being a good soldier, Hill was good at romancing women. He wrote to his sister that to be in love with someone is as necessary to me as my dinner. His first love was Emma Wilson, a Baltimore schoolmate of his sister's at Patapsco Female Seminary in Ellicott City, Maryland. Hill courted her while stationed at Fort McHenry prior to his assignment to Florida. The relationship was ended because Wilson's family did not believe the Hills were of equal social status. His next serious courtship was while at the survey office. He courted the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Ellen Marcy, the daughter of Officer Randolph B. Marcy. Miss Nellie, as she was known, spent several winters in Washington where she became noted for her charm and beauty. His competition for the affections of Nellie was none other than his former classmate, Captain George McClellan. McClellan had gained the respect and friendship of her father during the Red River Expedition in 1852. Her parents liked George even more when he announced his intention to resign from the Army to become an executive of the Illinois Central Railroad. When McClellan proposed marriage, Nellie turned him down and began to spend more time with Hill. Rumors swirled that Hill and Nellie were engaged. Her father, stationed in Texas, wrote to his daughter, In regard to Mr. Hill, I know but little of him. He seemed to be a gentlemanly man, and if he was not in the army but engaged in some business that would ensure you a comfortable home, I should not have so much objection, but I should suppose you would have more ambition. I inquired about Mr. Hill's family at Corpus Christi, and I am inclined to believe that they are in very moderate circumstances, so far as property goes. I shall expect that you at once abandon all communication with Mr. Hill. If you do not comply with my wishes, in this respect I cannot tell you what my feelings toward you would become. I fear that my ardent affection would turn to hate. One way or another, Miss Marcy heard about Hill contracting gonorrhea and began to spread the word to her daughter. Hill took offense and wrote to Nellie's father that Miss Marcy's objections are that from certain early imprudences, youthful indiscretions, I suppose, my health and constitution had become so impaired, so weakened, that no mother could yield her daughter to me unless to certain unhappiness. Although he did not quite deny the incident, he felt his honor and reputation would be destroyed if it became widely known. He also knew that such a rumor would ruin his chances with Nellie. Mr. Marcy apologized for his wife's actions, but in the end, Mr. Marcy and his wife would convince their daughter to break off the engagement and she would end up with George McClellan in the end. A rumored statement made its way to McClellan during an 1885 reunion that when A.P. Hill's troops were wreaking havoc on McClellan's Army of the Potomac, that it was a reprisal for having lost the love of his life. It was said that a soldier rolled out of bed, fell into line, heard he would have to fight against Hill's men, and exclaimed, My God, Nellie, why didn't you just marry him? When McClellan heard this, he said, Fiction, no doubt, but surely no one could have married a more gallant soldier than A.P. Hill. In 1857, Hill lost someone else. His father passed away. In April of that same year, he was a groomsman at a Richmond wedding of his West Point friend, Henry Heath. It would also be in 1857 when Hill wrote to his sister Lucy that a little siren had thrown her net around him and to expect a wedding soon. The little siren was a wealthy young widow named Kitty Morgan McClung of Kentucky. They had met at a party of a mutual friend when Miss McClung had visited Washington, D.C. in 1857. The enslaved woman who took care of Kitty as a small child remarked that she looked like a doll and gave her the nickname Dolly a name she would keep all her life. Hill would likewise call her Dolly. They began a courtship and Hill fell hard for Dolly's blue eyes and chestnut hair. The young lady was nine years younger than Hill, opinionated and a great conversationalist. They matched incredibly well. Hill wrote to his friend George McClellan that, 
I'm afraid there is no mistake about it this time, old fellow, and please God and Kentucky Bluegrass, my bachelor life is about to end, and I shall swell the number of blessed martyrs who have yielded up freedom and crinoline and blue eyes. She is young, twenty-four years, gentle and amiable, yet lovely and sufficiently good-looking for me. I expect to be married in Lexington, Kentucky on the 18th of July, and if you could come down from Chicago, you know that there is no one whose presence would delight me more. The two would be married in Lexington, Kentucky at her family's home. Since no one in the Hill family could make it for the ceremony, his soon-to-be brother-in-law, John Hunt Morgan, stood as his best man. After a quick visit to Culpeper, the couple settled into their modest home in Washington, D.C. The next year, on May 22, 1860, George McClellan and Ellen Marcy were married in New York City. Hill was a groomsman in their wedding. Later that same year, Pal and Dolly welcomed their first child into the world, a little girl named Henrietta, but Hill would call her Nettie. The election of 1860 saw Abraham Lincoln become president-elect, and six Deep South states adopted secession as the best course of action. Hill saw outright war as imminent by January 2, 1861. He wrote to his sister, who was still living in Baltimore, stating, Tell Carter to prepare to pack up his traps unless he desires to live in the Northern Confederacy, for surely the end is approaching. Hill worried that a war would make him take up arms against Virginia. His fellow officers at the Coast Survey insisted that if the war broke out, he would not be forced to take up arms, but this was a serious concern for the Virginian. He stated in 1847 that, There is one regiment on which I would stake my life, and that is the one from dear old Virginia. I would fight for its honor and reputation as soon as for my own. But the deteriorating situation led him to resign on February 26, 1861. In his letters, he expressed his family's ties, disenchantment with the federal government, and allegiance to the land of his forefathers as the reasons for his leaving the United States military. Hill took his wife and little Nettie to Culpeper and stayed with his brother Baptist, while the national crisis unfolded. When the news reached the Hill family about the firing on Fort Sumter, the 35-year-old Powell tendered his services to the governor of Virginia, John Letcher. He hoped that his experience would earn him general stars, but he found that to be out of the question. By the last week of April, Virginians including Hill were traveling to Harper's Ferry, the location where the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers meet, and the doorway to the Shenandoah Valley. He arrived by early May, and by the 9th, had received appointment as the colonel of the 13th Virginia Infantry Regiment. He treated his soldiers and officers alike. He issued a warning on May 25th. The colonel having requested that officers must attend the drill at half past nine, and some of them having failed to be present, he now orders that every officer of his regiment, not otherwise on duty, appear at this drill at a half past nine. Any officer failing to appear and without good cause will be arrested and reported to headquarters, and the same order will hold good as to the evening parade. Hill was a strict disciplinarian. During a long march, it began to hail, but he refused to stop the march until they made it back to Harper's Ferry. The men marched back into town wet and sore from the storm, but they came to the realization that army life would be more difficult than they previously thought. The chaplain of the 13th asked Hill for permission to hold religious services. Hill refused. A good fighter now is more desirable than a good preacher. The preacher bemoaned the fact that between daily drill and nightly picket duty, he had no opportunity of wedging in a sermon. Many of his troops were getting drunk at a hotel in town, to the point of being unable to perform their duties. So he had an entire company enter the hotel and inform the owner that he must remove the alcohol or the troops would do it for him. Hill was easy to spot in Harper's Ferry. He detested wearing a full uniform, so he would be seen around town in a calico or checkered shirt which Dolly sewed for him, neatly polished black boots that came almost to the hip, and a black felt hat. His accoutrements were a narrow saber attached to a belt on one side, a revolver on the other side, and oversized buckskin gloves which he inclined to wear year-round, and he was growing a beard like many of the men of the period. At this early stage of the war, Powell rode a black stallion named Prince. In June, federal forces began to operate along the Virginian-Maryland border, close to Hill's location. His commander, Joseph E. Johnston, would be sending Hill and other troops to Romney to confront federal forces. 